Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, a podcast where I share practical, simple and scientific ways to help you take back control of your mental health, improve your mood and memory, reduce anxiety and worry and help you live your happiest and healthiest life. In today's episode, I have the honor of interviewing New York Times bestselling author and one of my favorite authors, Dr. David Perlmutter and his son, Dr. Austin Perlmutter, on their newest book, Brainwash. In this book, they take on a uniquely modern challenge, finding genuine joy and wellness in a toxic culture of instant gratification. The book approaches America's growing epidemic of chronic illness from a simple premise. We know what we need to do for better health and happiness, but our ability to make good decisions has been hijacked by unhealthy digital media usage, processed food, lack of sleep, chronic stress, and other aspects of modern life. And our physical and mental health is suffering. This book offers a bridge between information and action, rewiring our brains to allow us to put into play those decisions that can help us think more clearly, strengthen our bonds with others, and develop healthier habits. Thank you once again for tuning in. If you like my podcast and enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving a five-star review and subscribing. And don't forget to keep sharing on social media and tagging me so I can see what you guys think and what you found most helpful or interesting. If you love listening to my podcasts and want to take your mental health healing journey to the next level, then I want to invite you to my 2020 Mental Health Solutions Summit, December 3rd through 5th in Dallas, Texas. The core focus of this conference is to give you simple, practical, applicable, scalable, and scientific solutions to help you take back control of your mental health and to help others and to make impactful changes in your community. You will learn how to manage the day-to-day stressors of life, as well as those acute stressors that blindside us. Our goal is to address your most pressing mental health concerns, help you find answers, and equip you with the knowledge and the resources that you need to make the change from living a life of barely surviving to one where you are thriving. There will be sessions on addiction recovery, sex and mental health, how to help your child become stress resilient and manage anxiety, how to detox your brain, nutrition tips to boost mental and physical health, and so much more. Early bird tickets are on sale now, so hurry and get yours today before prices increase on March 31st. We also have limited VIP tickets that include special private Q&A sessions with me and meet and greets with myself, and there are discounts available for groups. For more information and to register today, visit drleafconference.com. The link will also be in the show notes. Doctors Perlamuda, I am absolutely thrilled to have you on the show with me today. David, I have been a big fan of yours for years. I have all your books and I'm so honored and so excited to be interviewing you and your great son today. So thanks for so much for joining me. Well, Austin and I are delighted to be with you today. Oh, it's fantastic. I always love talking to a fellow brain scientist. So it's very exciting to see the unique angle that you two bring to this whole wellness industry. Because as I was just saying before we started the interview, there's just so much emphasis on diet and exercise and that kind of stuff, which is vitally important, but there's just not enough information or emphasis on mind. And I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I've been doing mind brain research for 30 years. And sometimes I feel like I'm the lone ranger out there. So when I read your book, I was so thrilled and so excited. So thank you and congratulations for getting into the mind side of things. Well, thank you. And all the work you've done over the years as well in this area has certainly helped pave the way. You know, there, truthfully, there are not a lot of of people out there doing this work. I had the opportunity this morning to interview Dr. Daniel Amen. As you know, he's also out there with us, really helping to spread the word that the brain has physicality to it. And as such, it very much is affected by lifestyle choices, for example. So 
we're all trying to sing the same song. And that's it. And the more of us that do it, the more people will hear it because people are very driven by thinking that they're biological robots. So I'm very pleased that you have tackled this from another angle. So it's, it's fantastic. So congratulations on the book and I'm excited to dive in. One of the first things I wanted to ask you was to talk about mental hijacking and how that undermines each and every one of us. So can you describe what that is and talk about that? Sure. So one of the things we were looking at to start with this book is why, despite having everything that it would seem we need to be happy, to be successful, are we still struggling with these preventable conditions, whether that's poor mental health or poor physical health? And so we tried to figure out where perhaps has the modern world hacked into our brains such that we are then trapped in these unhealthy patterns. And the two places that we emphasized were with regard to our food, specifically because marketers have exploited a sweetness hack that has been programmed into our evolutionary survival mechanism. And then the other one is with regard to our social connections in that humans like to spend time with other humans. It's how we've been able to survive over the millennia. And yet now marketers are exploiting that by offering us these social networks, which while they could be wonderful in allowing us to connect with other people, often actually polarize us against our friends and family and do the exact opposite of what is best for our health. Very good. Okay. So what I'd love for you to just explain is just give me a big picture overview of the book because it's kind of like two parts, your approach and then you've got a solution, a problem and a solution. So can you just give an overarching based on the question that you've just answered that the hijacking concept and the social media, the modern world love that. So give us the big overarching problem and the solution that you're offering in the book just to set the stage for my listeners. Sure thing. Well, I think as your listeners probably know quite well, the brains that we develop over our lives are going to impact the choices we make. They're going to impact the ability to make good choices. And we wanted to parse this out and help people understand what are the factors that are contributing to making our brains less likely to make good choices. So the first half of the book is basically explaining how aspects of the modern world have hacked into our brain circuits or have altered our brain circuits such that we're no longer able to make good choices. And then the second half of the book is explaining how we can, in essence, wire our brains so that we start making better choices. And it's talking about aspects like nature exposure, meditation, exercise that we can utilize in order to, again, wire our brains for better decisions. In doing so, we make it far more likely that we reach those outcomes we care about, good health and better well-being. Excellent. I love that. And I love how you say that as well in your book, that there's a gap between the knowledge and the action. So can you talk about that? This is uh, David. And as Austin said, this disconnection, in fact, that's what we call it in the book is disconnection syndrome, is really taking the the more superior, if you will, or the more thoughtful part of our decision-making apparatus offline. So this prefrontal cortex, I don't mean to be too technical for your audience, but... No, they're used to it. They're used to it. Good. We're only going to talk about a couple of areas, the prefrontal cortex, and then the less sophisticated, more primitive area called the amygdala. And what this disconnection means is basically taking the adult out of the room, removing what we call top-down control, whereby this prefrontal cortex is able to exercise control over the parts of the brain that would otherwise direct us towards more impulsivity, more short-term goal-related uh, activity and choices. And you know how this came to be, how we came to, to really discover this was we began to question what it was about our treatment care that was falling short with respect to patients, whereby we would learn as much as we possibly could by reading as much of the literature, the journals, go to the conferences, really enrich ourselves as best we could, then do our ultimate best to transmit that information to each and every patient, but then it would fall short. There would not be implementation. And we said, well, maybe the stuff we're learning isn't good enough. Maybe we're not good communicators and we're not able to present it well enough. And Really, that wasn't where the breakdown was occurring. The breakdown seems to occur, according to the literature, in 50 to 80% of the time with the fact that patients don't follow through on the information that they are given. So that's never really been looked at in terms of being able to work with that, being able to recognize that's a fault in the system, a weak link in the chain, if you will. Why don't we target decision-making? Why don't we recognize that 
patients are defaulting to their impulsivity center, the amygdala, and really disconnecting themselves from the prefrontal cortex. If we can bring back a better decision maker in their brains, they can make better decisions that will ultimately prove good for them in terms of their health based upon the information that we're providing. But we learned soon as we began to research this topic that this is a bigger subject than just the doctor-patient relationship. It's about the public in general making bad decisions as they relate to health. And it's about the public in general making bad decisions that even transcend the question of what do you do to stay healthy. That may involve what do you do with your money in terms of how you invest. What do you do to maintain balance in your family, to share in empathy for your neighbor, etc. So it becomes a really much more global discussion and understanding that we developed in Brainwash in terms of decision making across the spectrum that we approach our lives with day-to-day decisions that relate to everything. Our decisions based on short-term impulsivity, what do I want right now? Or are our decisions more in line with what will play out in the future? In other words, for example, how might my decisions today reflect upon changes to the planet in 10 years or changes to my own health five years from now? So looking forward is functionality kind of centered on this also, the prefrontal cortex. And then even beyond that, we learned that the prefrontal cortex versus the amygdala is really a discussion about empathy versus lack thereof. That empathetic activity really stems from keeping that prefrontal cortex online. So that when we want to experience, for example, cognitive empathy, the ability to share in another person's opinion which is so degraded by our modern life, that's for sure, our modern experiences, that is a function of the prefrontal cortex. When we want to act compassionately, when we want to understand the difference between right and wrong, when we want to understand the future consequences of our choices and actions today, these are all part of what the prefrontal cortex enables us to do. Therefore, it's in our interest across the entire spectrum of what I just described, to do our ultimate best to stay connected to the prefrontal cortex. This connection fosters connections to other people, to our planet, connection to the better signals we send to our genome, better connection to our microbiome, across the entire panorama of what it means to choose to be connected, all kind of leveraged in the home court advantage offered to us by reconnecting to the prefrontal cortex, which is the question, so how do we do that? And I think that's where our conversation may hopefully go as we move forward today. Oh, I love what you've just said. My head's got, I've got like 20,000 questions. I have to just comment on the a couple of things. First of all, well, thank you for saying what you said. Such an important angle that you have raised. And I love the fact that you are looking into people being responsible for the future, realizing their decisions have long-term consequences. In terms of the whole people not applying and you recognizing that gap, you know, you've got all this knowledge, how do you get the patients to apply? I actually wrote a paper on this years ago and did research around this as well on terms of carryover. It's a really really big problem that, you know, especially in today's age, you two picked this up very nicely in your book about how there's so much access to knowledge, but the application is such a problem. So I'm very, very excited to see how you are teaching people through this book. And I strongly recommend that all my listeners that you get this book because you really are teaching listeners to really tune into the fact that if you don't actually become aware of how you're living in this modern life, you are hijacking your brain. You are damaging that prefrontal cortex. That's really fantastic. I wanted to ask you related to that, you give a lot of tips and things, but how do you start taking back control of our mental health? How do we start thinking more clearly and making those better decisions and strengthening those bonds? We talk about the prefrontal cortex has got to get stronger. We can't, we've got to have a good connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. What can we start doing to recreate that? Some practical tips. One thing I would really want listeners to think about is that modern world has been set up for instant gratification. So there's always going to be something that seems like the best choice in a given moment, whether that's opening a social media app or eating a piece of junk food. What we need to do is start getting away from that. And for better or worse, the stuff that leads to long-term happiness is never about instant gratification. It's about creating long-term solutions. 
So this isn't something where you're going to overnight be able to wake up the next day and all of a sudden your life is fixed. With that said, what the research suggests is that there are a couple of things that we can do that will lead to pretty immediate benefits in our cognition and shifting our thoughts to the prefrontal cortex. One of the most interesting of those and the one that I've been recommending the most is actually getting one night of good sleep. So I want to, again, caution people telling them everything won't be fixed overnight, but some stuff might actually, because it turns out that just getting one night of good sleep seems to lower our emotional reactivity. It seems to decrease our need for junk food. We just don't want it as much. We don't want these snacks as much if we've gotten a good night of sleep. So I would say for anyone out there who's saying, listen, I'm struggling. I really just need to have something go right to allow me to make better choices, to allow me to have better relationships. Getting that seven to eight hours of sleep that first night is the probably the easiest way to get out on the right foot. There are also a lot of other descriptions of interventions we describe in our book. And one of the more interesting ones we just presented at a conference the other day is how even 10 seconds of exposure to a natural environment has been shown in a study to improve decision making as it relates to being less impulsive. And that was just looking at a picture of nature. And so you extrapolate that a little bit and say, what is it like when you spend time in actual nature as opposed to looking at a picture? And actually, the research has been done there as well. There's data to suggest that even 20 minutes of exposure to nature in an urban setting, so this isn't going out to Yosemite, this is just right outside of town or even inside of town, will lower a person's level of the stress hormone cortisol. So again, I think that the, the key takeaway from this is you want to start getting out of this spiral of making poor choices and into the spiral, the feed forward cycle of making good decisions. And the way to do that is to find the intervention that seems easiest for you to achieve such that you then build into a brain that is going to keep you making these good choices. And some of the easiest ways to do this, I would say, would be getting a good night's sleep as well as getting a bit of exposure to nature. And that's very practical and very doable, except people battle so much with sleep. And how much do you think that the current modern, we all know that technology, if it's not managed, is going to affect us. How would you say that the disconnection syndrome is contributing to people's sleeping issues? Sure. You make a really good point, which is that technology is affecting our sleep. The easiest way to understand why this is happening is simply that people are awake on their technology when they could be sleeping. And this is clear throughout children, adolescents, adults. If we're watching TV and pressing play on that one more episode of a streaming service, and now it's 11 p.m. and we have to get up at 6 a.m., that's just less available window for sleep. So there's nothing too complex about that. The more interesting stuff, though, turns out to be how does looking at these screens, specifically the blue light exposure from these screens, affect our sleep patterns? What researchers have shown is that the blue light coming off of these screens, things like e-readers, our cell phones, our computers, TVs, blocks the production of melatonin, which is kind of the triggering hormone for the whole sleep cycle. So it throws off our circadian rhythm. And so they find that people who are exposed to blue light in the hours before bed don't get as much restful sleep. There are a lot of pieces to it. I mean, another piece to consider here is when you're thinking about how you're using these devices, a lot of the content that comes through our screens is actually quite stressful. So I know that for a lot of people watching the news turns out to be a, a stressful experience. And you think about what does that mean? Well, if you're being stressed right before bed, your cortisol is supposed to be going down at that point, right? It's supposed to be reaching its lowest point at around midnight and then coming back up to help you get ready for the day. But if you're stimulating that stress, that fight or flight response, which goes through, again, the amygdala, you're basically telling your body, hey, there might be a threat, you know, whether that's coronavirus or a terrorist attack, chances are that's not going to happen in your living room or in your bedroom overnight, but your brain is not really designed to understand the nuance of that. So it might be sitting there while you're laying in bed saying, we're not going to sleep because again, the coronavirus might sneak through the front door and we've got to be ready for that. I know that you have a statistic in your book of a study that 40% of people's stress is coming from the political situation. So if they reading the news just before they go to bed, that's going to guarantee that they've just changed their stress levels and created that whole negative cycle that you've just described. You hone in on a, a very important point about this instant gratification, quick fix mentality, pop a pull kind of thing. And that's really, I found that in the work that I do, that's really a, a significant thing. Everything is fast. Amazon does well because they can, it's like one 
click of the button and you get your stuff. And so we've conditioned ourselves culturally to be instantly gratified. And I know from the clinical trials that I'm doing, where we look, we actually use the QEEG and have also found that the, we didn't call it disconnection syndrome, but we've also seen that the just the way that the gamma wave becomes overactive and starts spiking when it shouldn't. And for those, just to understand, for those listeners that don't know what a gamma wave is, it's when your brain goes into a very high level of deep thinking, you get different energy flowing through your brain. And gamma is when you are actually learning and integrating creating information. It's great energy to have. But when you are doing what you're hearing David and Austin explaining, this quick fix mentality, this worrying about the news and getting stuck on your cell phone and the blue light, you actually disrupt that flow of energy in your brain. And it really does upset how you function. I'm very, very pleased that you're talking about these things and showing the impact on the brain. Because I think in our instant gratification society, we're not realizing that what we're doing is having major physical effects on how our brain is actually functioning. Would you like to speak a little bit about that? That is so true. You know, you bring up a very good point. And again, the idea of gratification is really kind of perpetrated upon us that if I can only get this, buy that, have this or that, then I will be content. But people are not content. Content means having enough, right? You don't need any more. The glass is now completely full. But yet our internet experiences are constantly bombarding us with information leading us to believe that we need more. We need to buy this or that or do this or that because we're not good enough or we don't have enough, constantly fostering the flames of discontent. And that means keeping us unhappy. We're not going to be content as long as we give in to this. We need to really break that cycle. The more we do it, the more we wire our brains for unhappiness and being discontent because those neuron pathways, neuronal pathways, ultimately become much more strategic and much more indelible, though not fully indelible. The Dalai Lama told us that the brain we build reflects the life we lead. And that is basically an understanding of the science of neuroplasticity, that the more we choose to do something, the more we will wire our brains in favor of being able to accomplish that task. The more we engage in empathetic behaviors that demonstrate gratitude, behaviors that are good for us, and there's nothing wrong with that, that's for sure. But the opposite consideration is, on the other hand, the more we give in to impulsivity and wanting this immediate gratification and all of these things that other interests are trying to foster in our brain wiring, the more our brains become more adept at those activities. It's like learning a skill. But the good news is, the very, very good news is we can take full advantage of this process of neuroplasticity to wire our brains for a different outcome, to enhance our decision-making activities and abilities to enhance our ability to be more empathetic and compassionate and be more available to planning for the future. We just have to get started. And as Austin offered up earlier, simple on-ramp for an individual may vary depending on what is easiest for that person. In the book Brainwash, we describe a 10-day program Not to say that you have to engage in every aspect of that program, but the simple on-ramp for you to momentarily increase your ability to make better decisions might be, as Austin talked about, a better night's sleep, or it might be getting out in nature or even bringing nature into your home in the form of a potted plant. However a person chooses to on-ramp towards better decision-making will then, moving forward, make the next step, the next part of the program, that much easier. And again, Austin talked about these feed-forward cycles. We take advantage of that one step at a time, get the door opened just a crack, and then before you know it, you're able to look at your diet, look at your sleep patterns, look at your exercise, your nature exposure, bringing meditation on board, developing a gratitude journal, all of these components that allow you to actually reject what is happening to your brain wiring, and reconnect. And that is the brainwash that we are looking for. That time of the month can already be an annoyance, and buying safe tampons or pads just makes things worse. That's why my daughters and I love Lola. Lola is a female-founded feminine care brand offering high-quality period and sexual wellness products made with natural ingredients. 
Lola's tampons, pads, liners and cleansing wipes are all made with 100% organic cotton, no toxins, dyes or synthetic fibres. They also make it easier for women to get their feminine care products with customizable subscriptions to fit everybody's routine. Lola delivers exactly what she needs, exactly when she needs it. It's easy to edit your order, change your delivery frequency, skip a month or cancel your subscription at any time. Lola has made our lives a little less stressful. And the best part, every time you choose Lola, you're supporting a brand that gives back to women in need. To date, Lola has donated over 2 million period products and counting through their charity partner, I Support the Girls. It's never been easier to try Lola. Get started with a trial set today. Lola offers two trial sets, each featuring a mixed assortment of period products made with 100% organic cotton for just $5. Get 30% off your $5 trial set today. Visit mylola.com and enter Dr. Leaf to redeem your offer. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. I love that. I'm so happy you brought up neuroplasticity. I have to tell you this, David, when and Austin, obviously back in the 80s when I was doing my research, I remember saying, hey, the brain can change. And David, you'll remember back in the 80s, we were told the brain could not change. And I was told I'm asking this ridiculous question, but I pursued that question of when you change your behaviors, you will change how your brain functions and you will then change your behavior. So it's, it's, it's feeding, change your mind, change your brain, it feeds back to how your mind is functioning. And so to hear you explain so clearly that you're not stuck in a disconnection syndrome or you're not stuck with a hijack, you can do something. And that's what I love about your 10-day program. I love the way you use the concept of highways and you you can get on and off the highway. You're not stuck. We don't have to stay stuck with a brain that is disconnected or hijacked, that we can use this concept of neuroplasticity. As you think differently, your brain will change. I use this all the time in my practice when I was practicing with my patients. I'm so excited to see how you've actually applied that in the work that you're doing. Can you talk a little bit more about your 10-day program? You've got some great points there and you've raised a few points. Just talk a little bit more about the how it works and that it's not just 10 days. I like that point. That was one of my favorite points about your 10-day program is that this is not over in 10 days. This is just the beginning. Yeah. So this is Austin. As it relates to behavioral change, it's clear that it's hard to make habits in short periods of time that it takes, depending on who you listen to, anywhere between 60 days to a year to really solidify and myelinate those pathways that enable you to make those habits more ingrained into your brain. What we really wanted to do with the 10 day plan was to give people the insight and the feeling that they can really change their decision making process. So we tried to incorporate the most powerful information out there as it relates to these studies to give people the best opportunity to start experiencing what life would be like with a clear brain that makes better choices. And so, as you said, this is not a question of 10 days and then you're done. It's a question of trying these things for 10 days and then seeing how different life could be and hopefully getting pretty substantial benefit with the combination of all of these interventions to improve decision making. So what we try to do in the program is we go through each of the major topics from the book and explain them in more detail and make them as practical as possible. For example, we try to engage people with a digital detox in the start. And so that means resetting the way, no pun intended, but resetting the way they engage with technology so that they are no longer being used by their technology and instead are using it for their own benefit. So that's everything from the more nuanced pieces of grayscaling your phone and deleting apps that you no longer need to larger picture pieces like the test of time, which is a tool we developed to enable people to have a framework for how to deal with their modern technology. I'll just give listeners that because I think it is one of the most helpful pieces here. We call this, again, the test of time. It's an acronym, a mnemonic to remember to use the T-I-M-E every time you're interfacing with a digital technology. So T means you want it to be time restricted. That means if you wanna watch TV or go on social media, whatever it might be, that's okay, but set a limit so that you're not sucked in for another episode or another 20 minutes of scrolling through a social feed. I is for intentional. That means you have to have a plan. It's very different to go and say, I want to watch one episode of my favorite show because it brings me joy than it is to stumble into a YouTube video queue and two hours later say, I don't really know what happened with my time. M is for mindful. And I think this one's really important because it's so easy to 
forget that these things are affecting us. Now, earlier I mentioned how news exposure can activate the amygdala. And what we'd want for listeners to be able to do is when they're engaging with technology, whether that's a TV show, computer, on their phone, if they start feeling uncomfortable, to be aware of that. If they start feeling stressed, if they start feeling angry, if they start feeling annoyed, these are feelings that are, are worth paying attention to because they very likely would be unnecessary if viewed through a more objective lens. And then E is, I think, the most important of the T-I-M-E, and that's for enriching. The idea is we want to, again, use technology for our own benefit and not be used by it. So we're talking about getting a net benefit out of our technology use. And the way that I like to apply this one is every time I've engaged with technology, again, that could be on your computer, watching TV, take a pause and say, did I actually benefit from that? Did I come away feeling like that was a good use of my time? And I know for me, a lot of the time, the answer is no. And what that then tells me is I need to reframe such that the next time I interface with this technology, I have a better plan. So again, going back to the T-I-M part of the test of time. That is so helpful. And it's just so relevant to this day and age because technology is a fantastic thing, but it's once again, how you are making decisions about that. And that's core in your book, isn't it? Throughout the book is decision making, poor decision making and how our decision making can become hijacked. And then the whole wonderful good news of neuroplasticity that when we choose to change, we can actually change our decision making and change the way that our brain functions. So, I mean, that's really fantastic. I I really love that. I'm going to pick up on that theme because there's so many wonderful books out there by people that you and I know and respect. They're terrific books. And your books and my books, they're all useless. What do I mean by that? It means that you can have the most wonderful library, watch all the programs, etc., but they're not going to do you any good unless you implement what you're learning, unless you put it to use. And that's where the breakdown occurs. It's about the decision making. And I think it's really moving forward a hugely important area to focus on because as it turns out, the very same lifestyle issues that relate to chronic degenerative conditions like heart disease and Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes are at play in disconnecting us from good decision making. So this is looking at things like inflammation brought on by our food choices, inflammation brought on by lack of sleep or non-restorative sleep, higher levels of stress with higher levels of cortisol, all of these factors that your listeners have been hearing from you for many years, but all of these factors are at play now in terms of our ability to make good decisions in the first place. So while your listeners may know that maybe they should be cutting back on their refined sugars and ultra-processed foods, et cetera, that while they know this stuff, it's the action part that hasn't received any attention. And we are really all in for empowering your listeners and anyone else who's going to listen to regain that ability to, you know, we don't suffer from a lack of information these days. We pretty well know what we need to be doing. It's just that implementation part, making the decision that is, frankly, from a clinician perspective, what we've been blaming a patients about for years. Why didn't you do this after I told you? And truthfully, people blaming themselves as well, looking themselves in the mirror saying, why in the heck? You know, I read Dr. Leaf's book. I know it's great information, but darn it, I just don't do it. I must be a bad person. But the reality is stop the self-blame when you realize that you have been robbed of the tools to put that information into play. So it's really about offloading blame and regaining connection to the decision maker. Mm, oh, you explained that so well. That is fantastically important. And while we're on that route, I'd love to talk about the inflammation that is linked to when we make bad decisions. I mean, that's something that I teach my listeners a lot is that our mind decisions, it's not just the lack of sleep that we know that causes inflammation. We can understand that eating the modern American diet is bad for our brain and can cause all these problems in our body. And I try and teach my listeners, and you've really honed in on this now, is that our mind is also changing the physical reaction in our body. Like our brain and our body will respond to a virus in our body or to that chemical that's poisonous 
our thoughts are also doing the same kind of thing to our body. And you actually quote, I'm just finding that point here, you talk about the fact that there's a study that you quote where you can actually induce inflammation with depressive type thinking within seconds, which is what I've also found in my clinical trials, that just the minute that you start thinking in a toxic way, we see a complete shift in the way that the energy flows through the prefrontal cortex in the amygdala. We see high beta, we see the wrong kind of energy flowing. And it's instantaneous. And then when you give people good decision making, when you give people, I call it mind management techniques, we see the change in energy and we see the change in inflammation almost instantaneous when we look at the neurophysiology. I know this is also your area, David and Austin. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Maybe talk about that depression study and the relationship to inflammation Absolutely. And even more compelling is the research showing that if you induce inflammation transiently by giving an injection of either LPS, which is it's lipopolysaccharide, but it's a chemical, oddly enough, that happens to cover some of the bacteria that live in the gut. But it turns out to be what researchers use both in the laboratory, in vitro, and also in vivo in humans to induce inflammation fairly rapidly, or a typhoid immunization. Both of these have been demonstrated to immediately disconnect, immediately disconnect from the prefrontal cortex and increase activity are associated with increased activity of the amygdala. So you're basically inducing disconnection syndrome in lockstep with increased markers of inflammation that are measurable. So this whole notion that depression, for example, is an inflammatory disorder is in line with what we're talking about. It, like the other chronic degenerative conditions, is related to inflammation, which is related to some of the choices that we make. Because if you've got a brain, I mean, you've explained that beautifully. So if you've got a brain that is inflamed, the energy doesn't flow properly. What we saw in our clinical trials is that you get a drop in activity in the left hemisphere. So you get that alpha asymmetry. So I know you've looked at a lot of studies with fMRI and MRI, and you see a change structurally in the brain, and you see this disconnect. We're seeing it on the energy level as, as well. And we're seeing that there's a drop in activity, for example, in the left hemisphere, an increase in alpha in the right hemisphere. And that means that we've got a problem. If you get an increase in various different energy flow, there is a change. So in other words, our thinking, as you're saying, is going to change the structure structure of a brain. And then that's a negative toxic feedback loop. Now you can't think clearly. So your decisions are, are worse. And then you increase that inflammation. So it's like a hamster wheel. So what you are giving in your book, if I'm understanding you correctly, is in this 10-day program, in the principles that you're teaching, you're giving people ways to get off the hamster wheel. This is often, I, I think that's completely accurate. When a person bangs a knee or the knee gets swollen, we say you have a problem with the knee and that's why it's swelling. When a person's heart isn't working, we say you have a problem with your heart, let's work on that. And we treat these as diseases. These are conditions that we can look at what is causing this. But when we start making poor choices, we start having bad decisions. People look at that as, oh, well, you have a moral failing almost that yourself is the problem. As opposed to saying, well, wouldn't this just like the heart or the knee be a reflection of the way that your brain is set up and wired? And when we look at how conditions like depression and anxiety and all sorts of anxiety, PTSD, generalized anxiety, social phobia affect our thinking, affect the way that we see the world. And then we think about how the world affects the way that our brains are wired. You see that it's, it's not helpful to start or to continue using this blame paradigm where it's if you make poor choices or you're experiencing mental health, that is a fault of your own, as opposed to the way we look at problems in other organ systems. And as you mentioned, the thoughts change the way that we interface with the world. So let's say you're a person who experiences high levels of inflammation for whatever reason. That inflammation leads to depression. Well, we know that when people are depressed, they don't think the same way as people who are not depressed. And so when people are depressed, they tend to be a little bit more short-sighted. Similarly, people who are anxious tend to be a bit more short-sighted. And when you're more short-sighted, more impulsive, you're going to be acting in a way that leads you to making bad decisions. And those are the types of decisions that increase inflammation and then lead to, again, these same conditions. So like you said, it is a trap, this societal trap whereby we make these impulsive instant gratification type decisions that lead to inflammation, that lead to chronic stress, that lead to poor sleep, that then disengages our prefrontal cortex such that we continue to make poor decisions. And our goal with this whole program is to enable people to get off of that hamster wheel, as you said, and to be able to start seeing what's going wrong and to start making conscious changes to their brain anatomy 
such that they can live a life that is more synchronous with what they actually want, as opposed to being constantly the victim of other people's influences on their decision making. I love that. I love that. So we need to empower people to realize they can manage their mind. I mean, just the mere fact that we are having discussion now, we're choosing to have a discussion about this. People are choosing to listen to this information and they can choose to apply this information. It's a mind decision to start making changes. And then as you start making those changes, one little thing at a time starts setting up a very positive feedback loop between the brain and the and the mind, which is, is so important. We saw in our clinical trials, it took literally back up what you've just described. We have people that were just not sleeping, like a few hours a night, not getting into deep sleep, not getting the relationship suffering, not being able to process information, kind of offline and very depressed. And once we it wasn't direct therapy. It was through an app that I've developed. We basically, they, where they learn mind management, they learn about good decision making and so on. The application side, we saw the depression disappear. People started sleeping and we saw reduced inflammation because we looked at all the cortisol markers and ACTH and prolactin and various different markers. And it really does change as you start applying and doing one little thing at a time. It's not instant. It takes time, as you say, to build these things up. A change really does happen. I can't stop saying how excited I am that you are bringing mind into medicine. I train physicians. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I actually train physicians how to bring mental health management into their practices And because I'm in mental health for years. So when I talk to physicians that are as experienced as yourselves and you bring mind into the equation, I get so excited. You know, you've really made my day. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And this idea of bringing this information into the clinical environment is very exciting to us. Uh, we'll say moving forward that we're going to be working with actually a training practicing physicians incorporating this into a fairly prominent physician wellness program. So it's time to heal the healers and that might be a, the best place to start. I think so. I mean, if you look at the fact that with suicide, one physician a day is committing suicide because of the stress and the pressure. We really do have to look after those that are looking after us. It's so important. I wanted to just raise just a couple more very interesting things you bring up. You talk about narcissism and self-involvement and what that's doing to our brain. I, I love your angle on that. Do you mind just diving into that a little bit? Sure. Well, we live in a society that seems to be increasingly valuing me over us and the advent of easy technology to put your selfies online and get certain amount of likes is not helping that. But I think what's more important than looking at that aspect of narcissistic behavior is what is narcissism and it's an absence of empathy. And it turns out that a lot of research supports empathy in everything from general wellness to better relationships. As it relates to patient care, a substantial body of research indicates that patients with more empathetic providers do better. They're more likely to take their medications. And so we know that this trait, empathy, is so important. And it would be one thing to say, well, some people have it, some people don't. But it turns out, again, that we can actually create empathy. We can build empathy. And there are interventions that are so simple that enable us to do that. It turns out, too, <laughs> empathy, specifically cognitive empathy, or the ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes and see things from their perspective, is kind of an aspect that is fundamental to the prefrontal cortex. So that's why it's so exciting that all these interventions we talk about that activate the prefrontal cortex, that connect the prefrontal cortex to other parts of the brain, are also those interventions that are going to increase our empathy, our cognitive empathy. The interventions to increase empathy can be so straightforward. For example, gratitude journaling has been shown to increase empathy. Even just considering another person's point of view is an exercise in empathy. It's very straightforward. It doesn't have to be this whole complicated thing. There are certain types of meditation, like loving kindness meditation, that focus on how we feel about other people. There are a lot of different ways, depending on the person, to harness this ability. But one thing that I was really fascinated by and that something somebody might enjoy too is turns out that going into nature increases our empathy for each other and for the natural environment. So there's really there's no excuse to say that it's too hard to develop empathy, but I think it does mean you've got to turn off the computer screen and the smartphone for a little while and just reach out. And that could be reaching out to a friend, a family member, or one of my favorites is having a conversation with a complete stranger and doing my absolute best to see what is it that this person understands that I don't? So I think that you can make this really straightforward, and that is to assume that we don't always have all the right information. Assume that you're always a little bit wrong, and then that opens the door to interventions to increase empathy by taking other people's perspective. 
Striving to stay focused or with brain fog? If you're dehydrated, the ability to focus on one task almost completely vanishes. Thankfully, there is a solution to rapid hydration, liquid IV. What makes liquid IV so effective? Cellular transport technology, CTT, which is the optimal ratio of glucose, sodium and potassium and delivers water and nutrients into the bloodstream. It's the perfect balance to help you hydrate quickly and more effectively than water alone. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water can give you as much hydration as two to three bottles of plain water. I always make sure to have liquid IV added to my water on days I know I need to focus, like today. I've been working on my new book all day, as well as recording podcasts. Thankfully, Liquid IV is helping fuel me through it all. Get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code DRLEAF at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order on Liquid IV's website. Just go to liquidiv.com and enter the promo code DRLEAF to save 25% and get better hydration. That's liquidiv.com promo code Dr. Leaf. Don't wait. Start properly hydrating today. The link and offer details will be in the show notes. Austin, what you've just said now is so good. I read that in your book and I, I love that. And I've heard you say this before. Listening to someone else, not being threatened by someone else's opinion, but actually thinking that, well, even if I don't agree, it's still worth listening. Or as you say, realizing we don't know at all. There's always someone who you can enhance your own knowledge by listening to them. And that's doing such great stuff for your brain. And how hard is it really just to sit and listen to someone else and to get over yourself for a while? That's like not such a difficult, well, I suppose it is you difficult. Would <laughs> you, would think, think, you watch the news for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that it seems to never happen. I mean, I think that people go into conversations right now to prove the other person wrong, not to update their priors and to learn something. And this is just not an objectively good way to learn and to improve in life. At what point are we supposed to believe that now we have all the answers? I think that the only people who believe they have all the answers are the people who have stopped asking questions. Exactly. They've stopped growing. It's not just fan in the flames of not wanting to consider another person's perspective, but it's worse than that. It's fanning the flames of xenophobia that not only are they wrong, but they're bad and threatening even worse. We enhance that by locking ourselves into social media sites that only look at our perspective, that we go there because it's comfortable because, yeah, yeah, they say the same thing that we do, whether the world is round or the world is flat or they are liberal or conservative, it's our perspective when we lock into that. And that really devalues the incredible importance of the Agora interaction with people with other views and the dialogue. The word dialogue has, the first part is die. That means two. That means two people sharing ideas. We may not agree. That's wonderful. But at least there's discussion, which we are losing today. And it's absolutely going to stagnate us. We need diversity of opinion. Diversity begets resilience. And that's what's always moved the ball down the field. Mm, you've described tribalism, haven't you? And I mean, it's actually become such a problem in society today and it's damaging our brains. I mean, if that's not enough to motivate people to realize we just need to listen differently, that's actually very really important. That's definitely a, a, almost like a plague, isn't it, of the modern day era where we are not wanting to listen to other people's opinions. It's really a problem. We see this in the medical field, just like in the political field. People are divided into these camps as far as the best overall diet, whether that's keto or paleo or vegan or vegetarian or some South Beast Atkins. The truth is nobody has it right. And that's just based on the fact that why would we assume that after thousands of years of attempting to get things right, we finally today figured it out. And it turns out it's eating only animals. It turns out it's eating 100% plant. I'm not saying that those aren't the right diets. I'm saying that probability wise, it's very unlikely that these things, which people have decided in the last few years are important are the complete picture. So why can't we have the discussion? Why can't we ask about this macro breakdown, this macro breakdown or a micronutrient? I think it's all wonderful to come to the table and discuss the pros and cons of this. But I feel like even in the dietary world, most people are spending their time talking about how wrong the other people are and these ad hominem attacks as opposed to discussing the science, as opposed to discussing bio-individuality, which is there's probably a single diet for the entire world. 
there's probably 7.8 billion perfect diets, but it takes some time and it takes some energy and it's, it's a little bit tedious, but we're just not going to get to any sort of solution if people continue to double down on these absolutes. And Dr. Leaf, I, I just share a little anecdote. Last year, I was invited to be on a national television program, and I've done these for years and years. Dr. Perlmutter goes up to New York and appears on whatever the show may be and shares his information. It's always a pleasure for me to be have that national connection to share information. But this last time, again, a very, very, probably the most popular morning show in America, the segment begins, and there was four interviewers around a table, people that you recognize, and they summarily attacked me one after another, saying, first one has said, well, sugar isn't bad because we reached out to the sugar industry and they told us that sugar is great, so why could you talk about sugar the way you do? The next person said, well, we spoke to a certain doctor and he does not believe what you described in Grain Brain, and the next one was about an Alzheimer's association that said that lifestyle doesn't matter and why should we believe you? And I thought, gosh, this is a sudden shift I've never experienced before. And my response was about to be, hey, I'm a guest in your home. How do you feel good about treating me this way? But as I thought it through, I realized they had to do it. They are told they've got to be aggressive because that's what media is all about. That's what people want to see. They want to see the confrontation. And I submit that's not what we should be doing. The brain we build reflects the life we lead. If we can be listening to others' opinions and trying to be, dare I say, nice to each other, that is the brain that we will build, each and every one of us. So it's all about valuing this process that you described, neuroplasticity, absolutely a central thesis in brainwash. Oh, I saw that that's why I love your work. And I'm, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. But as you say, that that reflects the times that we're in where things have just shifted away from trying to grow to trying to almost control and push an agenda, which is not what life is about enhancing each other, not competing with each other. And those people don't, I don't think they realize in attacking you how they were causing inflammation in their brain. So there you had one up on them, David. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you something I learned from Austin a couple of years ago. It had to do with medical training, and he made a statement, and I think it appeared in one of his articles, correct me, Austin, if I'm wrong, but it was that doctors in training and in medical school are really pushed to higher and higher levels of achievement, but it's oftentimes at the under the paradigm of doing so while stepping on the shoulders of others and pushing other people down in order to get ahead of that person. It's this competition model so fostered. And hey, we all want the same goal here. Let's pull each other along as opposed to trying to get to the head of the pack by stepping on each other's toes. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. There's one of my favorite, I do a lot in quantum physics, and one of my favorite quantum physicists is philosophizing quantum physicists. And he says that it's not about us, it's about us in the world. And it's so true. You know, it's not about us in the world. I'm sure you two are familiar with the study that came out of Berkeley about the more times you say, I, me, myself, and I, you increase your chance of a cardiovascular event by 42% in the next 12 months. So here we are in a society that is encouraging me, myself, and I and competing and arguing and like it's just about me, me, me. But that's the worst thing you can do for your brain and your body. So books like yours, the work that we are doing, what we or I do, what you guys are doing, and this fantastic book you've written is really trying to come against that. That's right. And how interesting it is that in our current vernacular, those pronouns are used far more commonly now than even two decades ago, the collective programs of we and us and even them. But so you're exactly right. So we're seeing an increased usage of those pronouns. And now you call to our attention of the association with an inflammatory disorder, cardiovascular disease. And again, as we've described, parts of disconnection syndrome are you know, enhanced by this process, again, of inflammation. As a, just a, a way of generalizing it, you brought up the American diet. I think that we can be more global and call it a Western diet, which is really becoming the global diet or pro-inflammatory. When we relate inflammation to this disconnection and we relate the inflammation to the what's becoming the global diet, we see that this spread of this Western pro-inflammatory diet might well be related to the spread of disconnection. 
of people losing the ability to think things through and to act more empathetically, to some degree, we don't know what degree, but influenced by this global change in diet. I totally agree with you. You've hit some really hot spots and incredibly important things that are just starting to, it's just, you're just starting a discussion. And I'm so glad that I'm not alone out there in the mind and that there's more people doing the more mind approach. So it's fantastic. I know we've got to close this off quite soon, but I just quickly want to ask you a fun question. I work with two of my four children, my two daughters. In fact, my one daughter is sitting right here now. She's my producer. I would love to hear a little bit about how you two decided to write a book together and how that process went. Well, Austin asked me to answer first, and I would say that we have been lifelong pals. I've always considered Austin to be, obviously my son, but just a a great person that I wanted to spend time with, whether it's fishing or diving or all the fun things that we've gotten to do over the years. Now to be involved in these types of activities, focused not just on what makes us happy, but what can take the dare I say, skills and talents that we have and use them as an outreach for making perhaps the world a better place. It's really very, very exciting for me and an honor for me to be able to share that with Austin and therefore to be able to have this incredible entree to his generation. So I'm I'm honored that he feels that he wants to hang out with dad. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I relate to that totally. This is Austin. So I echo a lot of what my dad has said, and I think we have this tremendous opportunity right now to sit with the latest science, but also these millennia of understanding of what exactly seems to be linked to a better life, both from a health perspective and from a a general wellness perspective. And we get to combine our brains, sit, discuss the psychology, even the philosophy of this type of thing, and hopefully be able to make a difference. Because I think that Most people just don't have the time to sit and read over all this research and to put it together in a manageable way. And we have been lucky to have been able to spend the time to look over this stuff. The bottom line from the book is there's really no reason why we have to live lives the way we're living lives, that all of these preventable conditions in the modern world don't even have to exist, at least to the degree to which they are preventable. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to reframe the way we make choices. It's been so surprising to me over the last couple of years that despite the available research on this, we continue to operate from the paradigm of assuming the just giving people more information and blaming them for making poor decisions as though they just have an absence of willpower, that that is the best way forward. And so what we're trying to do here is to enable people to move past that and to understand that they can start making changes to build a better brain. It's really the meta level. It's you are improving the decision maker as opposed to putting all of our eggs in the basket of improving decisions. And so, again, being able to do this with my dad, being able to talk through this stuff and being able to bring this message to the public in such a wonderful way has been quite the experience. Ladies. Do you hate spending so much money on bras that just don't fit well, are uncomfortable and look boring? Well, I've got a solution for you, Third Love. Third Love makes bra buying fun, easy, convenient and stress-free. To find your perfect bra, all you have to do is take their quick online fit finder quiz. Answer a few simple questions to find your size based on breast size, shape and fit issues. If you need extra assistance, Third Love's team of expert fit stylists are available to answer any of your questions over chat or email. Every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, return it and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. This is hands down the most comfortable bra you'll own. I will never buy a bra from anywhere else now that I've found Third Love. And since everything I do is about helping you improve your mental health, finding a comfortable, well-fitting bra is one less thing to make you stressed. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they are offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash drleaf now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash drleaf for 15% off today. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. 
I love that. In fact, you've applied all the principles of your book just in the creation of the book because you've used empathy and listening and you've reduced inflammation. You've done bonding. You've probably went out in nature. You probably sat out in the sun. You've done all kinds. You've eaten great food. So you've done everything. You've had great sleep because you got so excited that you worked late in the night and had incredibly deep sleep, restorative sleep. So you've done it all and created a, a masterpiece. So that's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so David, here's a question for you. As a parent of insanely smart children, what's one piece of advice you can give parents listening right now on how to raise smart, successful, and healthy children? Okay, and I'm going to make this as a retrospective. I'm from the perspective of maybe what I would we would have done, or at least I would have done, because I think I'm more to blame on this, differently. And I think it's allow them to grow, reduce the constraints that I imposed based upon what I thought was important, more free time. In general, in terms of education, that there's great value to playtime. There's great value to the physical part of your day. But I think to be uh, less, less involved in constraining them to do things that we think are necessarily extremely important. I did want to say, just in closing, that I want to end this on a really, really positive note for all of your listeners, and that is that this is not difficult. It's just about getting started. Like Mark Twain said, the, the most important part of the journey is getting started on that journey, or something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. But the point is, no matter how you get that door cracked open, whether it's to just pay attention tonight to getting a better night's sleep, or fasting one day, or engaging this thing you've heard about called meditation, or maybe bringing in a plant, a potted plant into your kitchen, however you want to get started will make moving forward easier for you and allow you to regain a better decision-making apparatus. And I think that's one point that Austin has made throughout our time together, writing this book and presenting the book, and that is that our decisions come from this physicality of the brain. And Carolyn, as you have said over the years, that we can change that physicality. We can change our brains through neuroplasticity. It is not an immutable computer that only goes in one direction. In closing, the point should be a very much an empowerment based upon what we understand today in current science that, hey, there's an off-ramp here and I can regain control and make better decisions moving forward, which not only should lead to better health, but happiness as well. Oh, I love what you've just said. It's just so important and, and it's just so encouraging and right. It's what you're saying is so right. I totally agree. And, and I know my listeners are responding very, very well to what you're saying. And thank you for saying that. Last question. What are some wellness trends that you're both excited about and ones that have you concerned? So because there's a lot of trends out there. And you kind of touched on one, Austin, about the both of you actually about the diet. There isn't one diet. And I'm totally in your camp there. It's ridiculous when people say you can only eat one way. And that's one trend that is a concern. But in terms of use, you mentioned that, but are there any other wellness trends you're both excited about and ones that you're concerned about? I'll start. This is Austin. One of the things that has been a really wonderful change in the last several years is the increase of practices like yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. And so the CDC actually published a report recently showing that these practices have actually gone up dramatically. And so I look at that as people trying to take some steps towards reclaiming their mental real estate. Now, what is maybe tempering that a little bit for me is I don't love the idea of people saying, I want to continue my incredibly stressful life and find something to mitigate that a little bit. I do feel very strongly that it's, it's wonderful to be mindful, to meditate, to invest in these practices like yoga or any type of exercise or movement activity. But I think we have to be honest about our overall objectives. And if we're saying, I still want to do this high stress job because I want to make a bunch of money and hopefully that brings me joy. And in the meantime, if I have to occasionally go to a psychologist or occasionally do some mindfulness so that I don't lose it, then that's okay. I mean, I think it ideally allows us to, when we accomplish these activities, get to a place of being more honest with ourselves. And so Big picture, I've been excited by people taking more time out of their day to commit to themselves and to commit to understanding the way that the mind and the brain works. This is David. I would say that what I, I'm excited about, I don't know if I'm most excited about, but what I'm excited about is technology, for example, wearable technology that allows us to have some really good insight as to the effectiveness of the various lifestyle modifications that we're 
engage in, whether it's being able to wear constant glucose monitoring or things that give us insight as to the quality and quantity of our sleep, which really is something very, very important to know. We've never been able to really look at that before, short of getting a, a formal polysomnogram. I'm also excited moving forward about the ability of artificial intelligence to actually improve the doctor-patient relationship to bring a bit of the care back into health care. What concerns me currently, what I'm a little bit bothered by is there seems to be a, a kind of a low level movement to embrace an idea that we should be eating exclusively meat. And for some reason, there are people that seem to fan the flames that this is the diet that is best for us with the notion that our paleolithic ancestors basically ate meat all the time. Well, the premise of that, I think, is not in line with research, A and B. From my perspective, I think a diet that is more inclusive, that allows or actually welcomes dietary fiber from vegetables, etc., I think is a more balanced approach to human nutrition. So I think the thing beyond just this carnivore diet, I think the idea of locking into a specific mentality as it relates to diet, to the exclusion of any other discussion even, again, sort of fans the flames of this isolationist mentality and may not be, with all due respect, the best idea, especially in moving forward. Oh gosh, that's you both really summarize that so incredibly well. You're speaking to the choir here. I love what you've both said. Well, this has been, I, I hate to end this because I've enjoyed it so much. So I hope that you'll both come back on my show again. And how can people find out more about both of you and get the book? The easiest way is to go to brainwashbook.com. That's the website we're putting all of our studies from the book on and blogs. And if you do feel so inclined to look into buying the book, there are links there. But that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of both of us. My dad has drperlmutter.com, which is another good way to see what he's up to as well. Fantastic. Well, we'll put that in the show notes as well. I can't thank you both enough for your time and your wisdom. And you're both brilliant. And it's been a very, very interesting and very important discussion. And thank you both so much. And Dr. Leaf, thank you for having us. And really, so much gratitude for all you've done over so many years you're still in the batter's box, walking the talk. So it's really very encouraging for all of us. Well, thank you so much for that encouragement coming from you. That's really very, very special. So thank you so much. And I, as I said, I hope you'll both come back on the show again. Love you. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com. And to sign up for my weekly newsletter, where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.